Amen. Well, there once was a crew of Narnians who set sail for the east. Further east than any map of theirs had ever charted, further east than any of their people had ever gone, eastward all the way to the division between their world and Aslan's country. They took off aboard the Dawn Treader past the Lone Islands, past Dragon Island, past Burnt Island and Death Water. By the time they arrived upon Ramondu's Island, many of them were beginning ready, beginning to feel ready to turn back, go home. They hadn't reached Aslan's country, sure, but I mean, they had gone a fairly good distance further than any other ship and any other crew had ever gone before, and they were feeling content about that, satisfied. That is, most of them were. Most of them were ready to turn around and go home. There was still one member of the crew who had yet to speak up, which was surprising since it was that member of the crew who was usually the one who was doing the speaking up. That member of the crew was a mouse, named Reepicheep. His friend Lucy, wondering why he had yet to say anything at all, eventually asked him, aren't you gonna say anything, Reep? Aren't you gonna say anything? Are you cool with these people just turning around? Are you going with them? Well, Reepicheep answered her question at a level far higher than needed, at a level to where everybody around could hear him. This is what he said. My plans are made. While I can, I sail east in the dawn treader. When she fails me, I paddle east in my own boat. When it sinks, I shall swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country or shot over the edge of the world, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise. Reepicheep was not one for moderation. Not one for life as usual, not one for good enough, and certainly not one to give up upon adventure. Neither was the Apostle Paul. Writing to his beloved Philippians, whom he gladly affirmed, had already come so far in terms of their faith, so far in terms of their conduct, nevertheless sought to urge them even further onward with a prayer to the tune of Philippians, grow deeper as Christians, grow further as Christians. There is still more to be had. So sail east, paddle east, swim east and sink east if you have to until you hit the shores. His words uh, to us this morning, I pray, will have a stirring effect upon us. That God, through his word, would create in us or grow in us an eager fervency to go on further and further and further and further still into followers of Christ, into Christ-likeness. So let's pray once more and ask the Lord for his help toward that end. Father, we set no bounds upon you. We have no finish line in mind apart from you, seeing you. There's no maximum capacity. There's no maximum distance. You are infinite. So our ability to grow toward you is likewise infinite. And until the day you come to take us home, we want more. And so we pray, by your grace, through your word, you would give us more. You would grow us for more this morning. Amen. 
So Paul's prayer for the Philippians to grow Uh, Paul's prayer for the Philippians to grow is something we see right away in verse 9. Is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So right for the jump, here's my prayer, and it is that your love may abound more and more. And that phrase, you know, it's kind of a sneaky one, has such a nice cadence to it. Abound more and more. Just kind of bounces right along. Almost sneaks into the sentence entirely unnoticed. Kind of tiptoes in. Abound more and more. But make no mistake, my brothers and sisters, this is no moderate, no inconspicuous, no tiptoeing around concept. To abound more and more is immense. It's far-reaching. It is excessive. At a size or in a quantity that not only fills the space around it, but then flows over and spills out and rushes onward and then keeps right along going. Abound more and more. It comes with no off switch, no valve to turn off and stop the flow. To abound more and more is to progress onward, wholly unencumbered by the drag of moderation and the weight of being one far too easily satisfied. For love, then, to abound more and more, is to have a love that increases at levels on and on and on in glorious surplus. Paul's prayer regarding love is in this way, on a scale and to a degree that we rarely even fathom, let alone pray for. Abound more and more. So if that's the quantity of the love that he's wanting to see within these Philippians, what is its kind? What is its type? What kind of love is Paul referring to? The immediate context would suggest we're at least talking about love for other people, especially so people within this church, the Church of Philippi. The verses before resound with Paul's great love for these Philippians, describing, as we heard last week from Pastor Jonathan, how he held these brothers and sisters in his heart. He yearned for them with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And some verses later, he's going to reveal to us what can happen when there is a lack of love for people. Saying in chapter one, verse 15, some preach Christ from envy envy and rivalry, but others from good, goodwill. And it's the latter that do it out of love. What about the former? Their desire is not to love Paul, but to afflict him. So, Paul's prayer for the the Philippians to abound is very much sandwiched between the concept of love for others. On the one side, Paul's intense love for these Philippians. On the other side, what can happen when there's a lack of love for others? That said, I don't believe Paul is praying only for the Philippians to love one another more. He's not only praying for love for others. One reason I believe that is because he doesn't define it as love for others. He just says, love. And it is my prayer that your love, L-O-V-E, love, may abound more and more. Love in the most comprehensive sense. Love, you might say, with a capital L. The kind of love, as one commentator notes, that pervades one's entire being and marks every attitude and action. Paul is praying, in other words, that the Philippian church would be a church entirely marked by love, driven on by love. As an aside... I believe if he were writing to us today, he would pray much of the same for us, City's Church. That we, especially in an age of skepticism, is love even real? Is love just a fake? 
in an age of shallowness, I love with one foot in and one foot out. In an age of apathy, love is lame. Love is optional. Love is whatever. That we in a world like, like that, in a world rife with dulled and shrunken hearts, that we would be a people bright and blazing and abounding in love. A contrasting kind of people. A people who love and have love coursing through every fiber of our beings. A people secured by God's love and thereby freed up to love. A people eager to grow and abound in love more and more and more and more and more, never letting up, always desiring increase. We might might want to ask ourselves, would we want Paul to pray that for us? Are we, in our minds, already loving enough? Brothers and sisters, moderation in some things, sure. But love? Now, to be sure, Paul isn't praying for love to abound, period. Look at verse 9. See it with me. Look in your text. He doesn't just say that love would abound, period. He says, look at at verse 9, for love to abound more and more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And here's where I just want to hit time out. For those of us in the room who just felt a huge sigh of relief, whew, Knowledge and discernment are here. All right, I can relax. Knowledge and discernment are here. I can feel comfortable again. For those of us who feel that way, I I get it. I really do. But I want to challenge ourselves to ask, why might you feel that way? Why might the entrance of knowledge and discernment into the conversation provide you such a sense of Reassurance, security, safety. Might it be that we are imagining that knowledge and discernment have a subduing effect upon love? Abound more and more in love with knowledge and with discernment. Okay. Love's back down at a comfortable level now. Love's no longer going to alter my lifestyle anymore. Love is now pocket size. In this way, knowledge and discernment offers a type of shield, a safeguard from love, from ever really needing to feel it, from ever really needing to express it from mainly only ever needing to acknowledge it's there somewhere. Is that how we understand the relationship between knowledge and discernment and love? The one pushes down the other. Another way to ask it, is that how we think Paul understood it? Is that what we think Paul honestly desired for these Philippian brothers and sisters? That they would abound in some sort of semi-muted and tempered love. A type of love, convenient, comfortable, type you can lock away and take out only when desired. Here's the deal. It is a lie that knowledge and discernment and love clash with one another. It is a lie that love and knowledge go head to head, toe to toe, and hinder one another. It is a lie that knowledge and love are opposites, contradictory. It is a lie, hear me, 
that to grow in knowledge is to lessen in love and vice versa. In other words, if you are holding on to the claim that, hey, I'm just, I'm a knowledge guy. I do the thinking here. The love stuff is for others. I, I'm kind of exempt from that. I just do the knowledge part. That's my, not my piece here. Or if you're on the other side and you're holding on to the claim that, hey, I'm just a lover. We got the thinkers over there. We got the knowledge over there. I do the love thing and that's what I contribute. I'm off the clock when it comes to knowledge. If that's what you're holding on to, consider that the God whom you worship is perfectly okay with dwelling in perfect love, immense discernment, and great, impenetrable, unfading love. And he sees no contradiction with that. And he dares to call you to grow to be more like him. He abounds in the greatest knowledge the world could ever know. He abounds in greater amounts of love than our universe can fit. He says, I want you to be more like me. You got your personality, I get it. I got my personality. You might find knowledge easier, might find love easier. That's fine. But God says, I want you to abound now in both. Because your job is to reflect me. Now, note, if you take on that challenge, if you say, I'm going after both, I want love, I want knowledge, and I'm going after both in abounding measure, if you take up that challenge, see what you will be enabled to do as a result. Look with me at verses nine into verse 10. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. And now catch it, verse 10. So that, you almost kind of hear like a key unlocking something here. So that, doors open wide. So that, you may approve what is excellent. Love that abounds with knowledge and discernment enables a person to approve what is excellent. And how, help, how helpful, because not everything in our world is excellent. Some things are, some words, some thought patterns, some actions, some types of relationships. Some things in our world are excellent. Many things in our world are not. Without knowledge, our love at best would get evenly distributed across the two. We'd love some things that are excellent. We'd love many things that are not at best. But in reality, we are not morally neutral creatures. We are sinners. And so with the, without the aid of knowledge, we go after, we put all of our love toward the things that the world calls excellent, but in reality are fakes. We waste our love. It becomes detrimental love. It is, in every shape of the term, love in vain. But enter knowledge. Enter knowledge like a beam of light into the darkness. And suddenly our eyes are open and we are enabled to see that's excellent. That is not. We find ourselves suddenly able to discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. Suddenly able, as one writer notes, to put our highest affections on the highest values and not get distracted by lesser peripheral matters. In other words, not less love, not muted love, not love spread thin, but love 
perfectly aimed and sent fully into motion. Sign me up for that. Right? And it just keeps getting better. Think of it. What happens when you begin to eat, eat better? What happens when you begin, begin to eat better? You start to feel healthier, right? You feel like you're in better shape. You grow in your physical abilities. What happens when you start to move better, like better posture? Well, you reduce injury. You avoid sore muscles. You grow in strength, perhaps. What happens when you begin to sleep better? Most people in this room don't know. (laughs) Hypothetically, though, you would likely have better focus, more energy, feel all around more like a real human being. Well, let me ask you this question. What happens when you start to love better? What happens when you begin to regularly love and approve only what is excellent? Again, Paul tells us, see it in the second half of verse 10. Look with me there, verse 10. He says, so that you may approve what is excellent. So that's the, what you're enabled to do. Now here's what happens. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Enabled to choose what is excellent, you become conformed more and more into the image of his son who is himself pure and blameless. Enabled to choose what is excellent, you become transformed into that same image of the Son from one degree of glory to the next. Enabled to choose what is excellent, your character and your conduct more and more and more befit the label pure and blameless. Now here's where I want to be absolutely clear. This does not earn us a righteous standing before God. That is not what inward purity and blamelessness is for. That's what Jesus' death and resurrection is for. That's what our faith in Christ is for. We receive the gift of righteous standing before God by faith. We don't work for it. We don't earn it. And yet we do after we've received righteousness from God, we begin to reflect righteousness before God. See it, that in verse 10 through 11, all of this comes from him anyways. It's all from him anyways. See it, verse 10 through 11, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the righteousness that comes from where? Your effort, your energy, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. See, it's all from him. It's all from him. It all comes through Jesus. Our state of righteousness, our state of being righteous before God, our fruit of righteousness inward that reflects God, God is the the source of both. So consider with me for a moment any love that you have within you. Any joy you possess. Any peace you maintain. Whatever patience you exhibit. Whatever kindness you extend. Every ounce of goodness faithfulness and gentleness within you, every last bit of self-control, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, it all has been given to you through Jesus Christ. You have only ever received from God. 
we receive from him the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ. And why? See, Paul's logic is still progressing here. Why? Where's all this moving? What's the aim of it all? What's the purpose? What's the motivation? It is, quite simply, the glory of God. See it at the end of verse 11? Little phrase. To the glory of and praise of God. That's the ultimate end of this whole thing. That's the ultimate goal. That God would be glorified. But Paul gives us, in this text, a certain context to consider when it comes to that glory. A unique context, a specific context for us to see where and when God is glorified. And this will be our last point for this morning. What is the context of God being glorified in us? Verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Okay. What are we doing this for? Where's all this heading? the day of Christ, the great and holy day when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead. And so our love abounds. Our love abounds with knowledge and with discernment. And so we're enabled because of that to approve what is excellent. And we continue to approve what what is excellent. We put that into practice. And our character, our inward self, becomes more and more fitting of the title, pure and blameless. We grow in Christ-likeness in a sense of subtraction. Our sinful desires and inclinations begin to go out, replaced by pure and blameless. We grow in Christ-likeness in terms of the positive, in terms of addition. We grow up in the fruits of righteousness. And what for? For God's glory, specifically God's glory in the context of Jesus' second coming. So, we want to be a kind of people who live our entire lives in anticipation of the day of Christ. Constantly, unrelentingly fastened upon the day our Savior comes back again. Straining, longing to grow in purity, longing to grow in blamelessness, to grow in fruits of righteousness for that day. Because when he comes, we want to offer to him our very selves and say, look, look at my heart, look at my mind. Look at all the pathways of sin I used to have here. Look at all the highways of sin that I paved here. Look how I've changed. They're gone. All those stains that I had from my sin, all those, all those thought patterns I had with sin, all the fruits of sin that I had grown and so choked out my heart for you. Look how through time spent with you, through time straining on toward you, look how that's gone away. See my heart. It's not what it used to be. See my mind. It's not what it used to be. I'm a different man. I'm a different woman. You have changed me. And I give to you my heart. I give to you my mind. I want it to be beautiful for you. For love. For love, I endeavored to live my life in such a way that I would be transformed to become beautiful for you. You made me yours before any improvement in me. You loved me at a time when I was still yet a sinner. You called me child, and you gave me every spiritual blessing in the heavens when I had as yet to do nothing to deserve it. And for love, for love, I wanted my heart and mind to be pure for you. I wanted to be blameless for you. 
that you might be glorified in this, my spiritual worship, the transformation by the renewal of my mind, the testing and discernment of what is your will, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, how worth it would it be to spend your next 20 years, your next 40 years, your next 70 years toward that end to be able to say, look, Jesus, it's my gift, my very self to you. So my brothers and sisters, abound in love. Abound in knowledge. Refuse to treat either as optional. Abound in them and then put them to work. To root out every single thing from your mind and your heart and your habits that is not excellent. That is not growing you in purity. That is not cultivating within you blamelessness. That is not producing in you fruits of righteousness. If it is the way you use your phone, the way you relate to others, the way you talk, the places you travel, the mental pathways you go upon, if it is not excellent, why have it there? Why have it in your hand? Why have it in your heart? Why have it in your habits? Why have it in your mind? A great day is coming. Aim to present your very best to Jesus on that day. Sail east. Paddle east, swim east, and if necessary, sink with your nose to the sunrise until you hit the shore. It will be worth it. It will be excellent. Now, in just a few moments, <clears throat> we're going to have a few individuals coming forward to be baptized as a display before you, their church family, of their faith in Jesus. Their being baptized is also a fruit of their faith, their obedience and desire to be obedient to Christ in all things, including the call to be baptized. Their being baptized is also a proclamation that they intend to live their lives from here on out entirely given over to the glory of God. So in just a moment, we're going to sing. Before we do, let's pray. Father, perhaps more than anything, we ask that you set the reality of the day your son comes again to take us home. That you would set that reality in our focus, in our foreground as a people. That we would live inclining ourselves according to that great day. We want to have hearts and minds and souls that display your worth, that say Jesus is worth our everything. And so we pray by your spirit, according to your word, with the help of your people, would you grow us to be a people pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness for that great day, we pray in your son's name, amen.